بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم على بركة الله سوف نفتتح المؤتمر العلمي الدولي للافتراض الأول بكلية الطب جامعة ذي قار برعاية السيد رئيس جامعة ذي قار المحترم الأستاذ الدكتور يحيى عبد الرضا عباس وبرئاسة الأستاذ الدكتور حازم ريسان الخفاجي عميد كلية الطب Welcome to the ذي قار Medical College First International Medical Virtual Conference. الآن كلمة السيد رئيس الجامعة المحترم الأستاذ الدكتور يحيى عبد الرضا عباس مشكورا. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وآله وصحبه المنتجبين السيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته في الوقت الذي تجتاح فيه العالم جائحة كورونا وتصيب الملايين وتقضي على مئات الآلاف وتشل الحياة وتعطل الأعمال والإنتاج وتغلق آلاف المعامل والمصانع وتعطل الدراسة في المدارس والجامعات وتدخل العالم بأسره في صدمة وحيرة موقعة باقتصاديات الدول في مصرع ومتسببة بضياع الملايين من فرص العمل وتزايد الفقر وتهديد مستقبل دول وقد تطيح بها رغم هذا يشهد العالم تزايد النشاط البحثي والدراسات العلمية والطبية من أجل الوصول إلى مخرج لهذه الأزمة قد يفضي إلى اكتشاف علاج أو لقاح ينهي الجائحة ويخلص العالم فقد تشكلت على صعيد الجامعات والمؤسسات العلمية ومراكز الأبحاث العالمية ورق بحثية كبيرة وأصبح العالم وبكل مؤسساته العلمية والبحثية متواصل وفي حالة استنفار قصوى من أجل الوصول للحل وفي سباق مع الزمن وهكذا الحال في الجامعات والمراكز البحثية العراقية فقد بادرت إلى استنهاب طاقاتها وتحريك عجلة البحث العلمي لمواكبة ما يجري في العالم فكان لأساتذة جامعتنا وباحثيها دورا مهما في هذا المجال توزع بين تصدر عدد من أساتذة كلية الطب في علاج المرضى وتجريب عدد من البروتوكولات العلاجية العالمية فيما تناول آخرون دراسة الجوانب الوبائية للجائحة وكذلك إقامة عدد من الورش والمحاضرات العلمية والتوعوية للحد من انتشار المرض فيما اشترك باحثون آخرون مع فرق بحثية في جامعات أخرى عراقية وأجنبية كما تم تشكيل عدد من الفرق البحثية في الجامعة ومن شتى الاختصاصات لإجراء الدراسات الجزيئية والتركيبية لتحديد النمط الوراثي للفيروس وكذلك دراسات مناعية حول المرض وتم الاتفاق مع الزملاء في جامعة البصرة من أجل توأمة العمل للوصول لأفضل النتائج وما مؤتمركم هذا إلا جزءا مهما ومكملا للطريق من أجل إدامة الصلة مع العالم ومعرفة آخر المستجدات أتمنى لكم جميعا التوفيق والنجاح في مؤتمركم مبتهلين إلى الله العزيز القدير أن يخلص العالم من هذا الوباء ويسعد خلقه بالانتصار على المرض وأن يحفظ بلدنا وشعبنا أقدم شكري وتقديري للأساتذة الباحثين المشاركين سيما ضيوفنا الكرام متمنيا لهم التوفيق الشكر والتقدير لجميع الحاضرين من أساتذة وباحثين وطلبة وضيوف شكري وتقديري إلى عمادة كلية الطب والسيد عميد الكلية لإقامتهم المؤتمر والشكر والتقدير إلى الأساتذة في اللجنة التحضيرية واللجنة العلمية ولا ننسى أن نقدم الشكر للأخوة والزملاء بالإعلام لتغطيتهم نشاطات المؤتمر 
ومن الله التوفيق والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا شكرا جزيلا إلى الأستاذ الدكتور يحيى عبد الرضا عباس رئيس جامعة ذي قار المحترم على كلمته آه الآن كلمة السيد عميد كلية الطب رئيس المؤتمر الأستاذ الدكتور حازم ريسان الخفاجي مشكورا Hello ladies and gentlemen It's my great pleasure to welcome you in our first electronic medical conference on current crisis COVID-19 which is attacking many countries in the world This conference takes place in the Qar Medical College in Nasriya city the city of first letter the city of cradle of prophet Abraham peace be upon him We are very grateful to all of you to join our conference, which opens the door for scientific cooperation between our university and other universities in the world. We are very glad to find such an accepting response from our colleagues in different cities of the world, in a way that enhances exchange of scientific experience to deal with and manage the crisis in proper way. We are fortunate to have the support of our university represented by the head of the university esteemed professor Dr. Yahya Abdurrahman. We bless the effort of everyone who participate and support the conference especially the faculty members of our college and the members of different organizing committees of the conference. Special thanks to the wonderful lecturers from inside and outside our country. Let me now close by wishing you a delightful and purposeful time. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Prof. Dr. Hazim Hazim Raisan Al Khafaji, the Dean of the Medicine College and University of the Kar. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Hazim Raisan Al Khafaji, Amit Kuliyat. الطب المحترم رئيس المؤتمر نفتتح مؤتمرنا الآن بالنشيد الوطني العراقي start the agenda of the first international virtual medical conference we have uh, two sessions the morning sessions and the uh, evening sessions the the uh, morning sessions under the title of the current covid-19 crisis and it is sequely on the health we have uh, four lectures the uh, dr paul kaden and dr mudar al khairallah and Dr. Uh, from the UK, and uh, from Syria, we have uh, Dr. Faiz Sandouk, and uh, the last one from the Iraq, uh, Dr. Dhiya Khalaf al Umar. First, we start a 20 minutes talk with the uh, Dr. Paul Kaden, consultant in respiratory uh, medicine, Dyson University Hospital Trust. COVID-19 unit, and the, the title of uh, his speak is the uh, clinical cases and challenges of COVID-19 uh, disease. 
Okay, we'll start with the uh, Dr. Paul Kadin. نعم دكتور مضر اهلا وسهلا السلام عليكم اذا ممكن تشوفون حتى تشوفون فوق نعم الفيديو دكتور احمد شغل الفيديو اي نعم Good morning everyone I hope everyone can hear me okay um we uh hope the technology holds up and uh thank you for the invitation to speak um so I'm a consultant here in Kayside uh we're currently speaking to you from Peripheral and Infirmary, which is obviously the nicer part of the region, which is why Mudder and I uh, have chosen to work here. But uh, a lot of um, what we've been asked to do in terms of our COVID response is centered around uh, the hospital in Dundee. So uh, the National Health Service, the government in Scotland and the UK have provided a lot of information through public health bodies which seem to be ever changing. Uh, and certainly every 24 hours at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, we appear to be issued with uh, new and updated advice. Essentially, uh, we are not going to be able to cover every aspect of COVID-19 here today, but I would point you uh, to the CPS website as a excellent resource that has open access uh, respiratory articles. Uh, and also the Royal College of Edinburgh uh, educational portal, which is free uh, registration at the same time. So what we've done here in Tayside is that we have created a hospital within a hospital. So we've created what we call the COVID unit, which is essentially there to accept likely and probable cases of COVID-19 directly to what was the infectious diseases ward ensuring that we've got a good level of control in terms of infection control and a concentration of staff, multidisciplinary teams that have become experts in the recognition and management of COVID. Uh, we've had uh, some publicity around uh, our efforts. And in fact, we've just seen this morning that there is an article in the, in the Times in London uh, with regards to uh, the efforts in Tayside. Um, our, our ward uh, was an ideal place to undertake this endeavour as it was already set up with uh, half the negative pressure rooms for Scotland available to us in one ward. Um, the priority, as I'm sure you will all know from your own experiences with COVID-19, is good protect infection control and protection of staff to allow us to be well enough to treat our patients. Um, and, that, and that's the forefront of, of what we're doing. The, the medicine beyond that is relatively straightforward with some interesting cases that hopefully I will be able to, to share with you. In terms of the hospital within a hospital concept, we've had to set up not just an admissions ward, but downstream wards for convalescent patients, and also a completely separate high dependency unit and a separate intensive care unit for COVID-19 patients. So onto the cases, which I hope you will find interesting. I've picked out from cases that we've uh, looked after in Dundee over the last few months. So the first case is a case from quite early on in the pandemic. It was a 47 year old female. She presented them with what was the classical triad of cough, fever and breathlessness. And she was quite rightly admitted to the COVID unit along the COVID pathway. She was admitted to Ward 42 to a side room and her swab came back negative. Unfortunately, this lady was clearly not well and it became apparent that she was having increasing difficulty with breathlessness. Her saturations were dropping and she required increasing FiO2 and very quickly was uh, in clear type 1 respiratory failure despite a non rebreath ward level oxygen. At that stage, we hadn't fully uh, transformed the hospital. So this is very early on in the pandemic. So our level two bed uh, in the ward was utilized to commence her on CPAP therapy. She went on to have a second and third swab 
from a nose and throat, we used combined swabs here in Tayside, and they were again negative. I'm going to show you her x-ray on admission. This is her x-ray on admission, which is subtle interstitial changes, predominantly around the right lower lobe. And then as she becomes more unwell, we can now see that she has bilateral peripheral changes and clearly has a very abnormal chest x-ray. Again, as we have found over the last two months, we have accrued a lot of information across all specialties. And I think we would consider this to be classic radiological change for COVID-19 in the context of somebody presenting with the classical triad of symptoms. Because we were concerned over uh, making a diagnosis uh, and trying to increase our likelihood that we were correct in our diagnosis, she went on to have a CT scan. We uh, are going to present a couple of the slices as we go through her chest. So again, the CT changes reflect the chest x-ray changes with peripheral ground glass change and then dense consolidation in the posterior zones, gravity dependent. And I think that the, the Italian and the London intensive care departments have certainly come up with some interesting hypothesis about the different phenotypes and how the phenotype may change over time and may be a, a more normal lung at the beginning of the disease process and then through a combination of insults, uh, including possibly local microthrombosis, we develop a more classical ARDS phenotype H profile. So this lady, as again, was early on in the pandemic, so she was transferred to a side room at that stage in the clean ICU because she was an indeterminate patient. We hadn't proven that she had COVID. But as soon as she was intubated and uh, she had a lower respiratory tract sample sent with an endotracheal aspirate, that came back immediately positive. At that stage, she was then cohorted into our COVID ICU, where she spent the next month intensive, uh, intensive care in the COVID ICU. She actually improved to the point where she uh, was uh, able to have a tracheostomy and was able to be uh, discharged back to the clean ICU because her PCR was negative over a series of samples. But unfortunately, she passed away through complications, which were, again, thrombotic complications of her disease. But these were outside her lungs. They were extrapulmonary thrombotic complications. So I think the learning point that we learned very early in our understanding of these cases was that we needed to use clinical acumen to determine the likelihood that patients have COVID. So a little bit like looking for a pulmonary emboli, the pretest probability, the likelihood that you think that they clinically have the disease is extremely important in interpreting the swab results. And whilst we've not found any false positives, we have certainly encountered a number of false negatives. And the literature would suggest that this is potentially up to 30% of cases. I think it's very important to recognize that the data that came out of China that was published in JAMA clearly indicates that different body tissue types have a different prevalence in the same patient of PCR positivity for coronavirus. And it is therefore very important that we consider repeated and deeper sampling of the respiratory tract if we are considering COVID as the likely diagnosis. The opposite of that is that two weeks later, we had a, another gentleman who presented in an almost identical way to this first patient. And despite three negative tests, we then decided that actually we thought that he didn't have COVID and we took him out to the clean area and he actually had a drug-induced pneumonitis. So it's important to recognize that normal respiratory pneumonitis is still occurring at the time of COVID-19, but it becomes increasingly hard to diagnose when we're limited for infection control purposes in what we can do. So eventually, we have to adopt the fact that we will have to do our normal tests, we will have to do CT scans, we will have to consider bronchoscopy if it's absolutely required. So moving on to the second case, we uh, have a gentleman 
who is in his 60s, who's again admitted relatively early on with uh, COVID symptoms of fever, cough, and profound lethargy. And this is another clear factor that we've seen with our patients where they are developing extreme lethargy, often convalescing over weeks in the hospital uh, to return to a normal level of activity. He had significant comorbidities with diabetes, asthma, and obesity. And again, this is a very common finding that we're finding with patients that have been hospitalized rather than patients who have had symptoms and stayed at home. He developed respiratory failure and required a 48 hour period of invasive ventilation on ICU. He then had two negative swabs and was discharged back to the respiratory ward where I looked after him just prior to his discharge. I met him on day 10 and at that stage he was, he was well. He had saturations of 91%. Uh, we were targeting saturations of 90 to 92% for all our patients, uh, balancing the global need for oxygen within the hospital and the specific oxygen requirements for patients. Um, and he was discharged home and he actually did two days of physio where he managed two flights of stairs without any problems. And this was his x-rays when he was initially admitted to the hospital. He again shows diffuse bilateral pulmonary changes. And again, bilateral pulmonary changes was one of our um, pointers towards the likelihood of COVID disease. Often other patients that are presenting with classical bacterial bronchopneumonia are presenting with unilateral changes. We've also found that these patients, if they've got COVID are almost invariably lymphopenic. And in fact, for patients that we have, and we've had a multitude of patients that we've assessed and found to be negative, we found that they generally have normal lymphocyte counts. So this gentleman deteriorated. We can see that his bilateral lung changes, particularly on the left, have worsened. And we can see that he now has developed the, the usual appearance of a gentleman who's gone to ITU with the central line, the endotracheal tube, the nasogastric tube. He improves, and this is his x-ray just prior to extubation. So his x-ray hasn't returned to normal, but he's clinically improved. And uh, he was able to be extubated quite early. And we found that for quite a number of patients when they turned around relatively quickly. Unfortunately, this gentleman became unwell six days after his discharge. He presented with a pleuritic chest pain, saturations of 83% and a collapse. Uh, he uh, was phoned back through to the COVID unit, but given that we knew that he was COVID negative, uh, after his uh, COVID positive test and his presentation was different, he was asked to attend the emergency department. Well, quite rightly, my colleagues assessed him for a pulmonary embolism. This was his chest x-ray on readmission, which shows that his chest x-ray changes that were quite profound a week before have improved, but are still persistent. This is his CT pulmonary angiogram showing significant central pulmonary emboli, saddle across the trunk with evidence of clot in both the left and the right pulmonary artery. He had quite extensive pulmonary clot. We can see from his CT imaging that alongside the clot, he still has this classical peripheral ground glass change, but certainly not the dense consolidation that we've seen with the patients who required days of ventilation. Uh, he recovered well with full treatment dose low molecular weight heparin and supplemental oxygen. My colleagues did consider him for thrombolysis, but he was always cardiovascularly stable and he did not require this. He spent a week in hospital and has been discharged on the Pixabat. I think it's important to recognise that there's been a lot of discussion about thrombosis. We've seen that both these initial cases had evidence of thrombosis, both during their illness and shortly thereafter. There is still great debate over what the right thing to do is with regards to thromboprophylaxis. And we've adopted a research first policy here in our hospital where we are doing our normal thromboprophylaxis and thinking about DTE early in presentations, particularly after this case, which is uh, clearly a dramatic case of a post-discharge TE. But we have not adopted the high-dose thromboprophylaxis recommended by London as actually this has been a grade D evidence approach rather than based on actual trial evidence. And we, we wish to wait for the trials. The third case is a gentleman who has uh, presented at 61 
with a number of weeks of cough, initially at staying at home and following the public health advice to self-isolate. He then, after about two weeks, has developed worsening breathlessness. And at the time of presentation to the paramedics, the paramedics found him to have 70% oxygen saturation. When he was admitted to the COVID unit, uh, he gave a history that was consistent with a viral illness, with myalgia, headaches, sore throat, and GI disturbance with vomiting and loose stools. We have seen about 5% of cases present with a sole GI presentation, but the vast majority of cases that we've seen have fulfilled the classical viral prodrome, classical cough respiratory illness presentation. He again has the classic comorbidities that seem to predispose people to a more severe illness with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and reflux. He was an ex-smoker. He'd stopped working about four years before and was a retired refuse collector, but had a reasonable exercise tolerance. His chest x-ray on admission to, to the hospital again shows bilateral changes, again, slightly more subtle than the previous cases with a little bit more dense consolidation within the left lung. He uh, did deteriorate during the time that he was in hospital. It was obvious that he was not well at presentation and he developed worsening changes whilst on the high dependency unit. And we can see worsening changes now in the right lung with slight improvement perhaps in the left lung. So this gentleman was recognized and this was later in the pandemic and he was recognized that he's likely to have COVID. And actually we were moving some patients on the basis of their pretest probability even before their swab result was back and cohorting in alongside other positive cases. He was positive on his initial swab and he was transferred for the initiation of CPAP. In Tayside, we made a decision fairly early that whilst we were uh, going to target slightly lower saturations at 90 to 92%, that we were going to offer CPAP as our preferred respiratory support. Again, based on discussion within the team and based on the experiences of others, particularly in London and in Italy. For this gentleman, there was multiple discussions with the intensive care team. He obviously had some comorbidities. I think the respiratory team felt clearly that if he presented at any other time out with the pandemic, he would clearly have been somebody that we would have recommended for intensive care, level three, invasive, positive pressure ventilation. Our intensive care colleagues were extremely worried about his presentation and his comorbidities and the fact that he had many of the markers that were uh, markers of not doing well when ventilated on an intensive care. After much discussion that included the patient, the family, multiple physicians, multiple intensivists, a decision was taken that whilst he would be offered intensive care treatments, we would try and treat him for as long as possible on a level two environment, awake with CPAP therapy, as it was felt that this was offering the best likelihood of improvement. Overall, he was treated for eight days on medical high dependency and he received a combination of CPAP, but actually he did also, um, because he was in the cohorted area of the nurses in full PPE protection, he had periods on high flow nasal cannula to aid his weaning from respiratory support. After eight days, he was able to be discharged back to the ward on six liters of oxygen. And over the next six days, he improved and was discharged home. So had a very successful outcome from a very difficult presentation. Even when he was admitted back to the ward, his x-ray was still not normal. And I think we are anticipating that many patients will have significant uh, disease uh, going forward, particularly if they've been to intensive care. The last couple of cases uh, take us a little bit outside of the lung. This was a 65 year old man who was already known to have COVID because his wife was a healthcare worker and we were testing lots of healthcare worker families as part of our screening process. He then presented with a deterioration in his breathing after 10 days of a viral illness with GI upset. He again had type two diabetes and was known to have ischemic heart disease. He presented with metabolic disturbance with ketones of 2.6 and was on multiple diabetic agents. It's very clear that some patients are presenting with de novo 
new diabetes with euglycemic and uh, hyperglycemic DKA, and those with diabetes are having worsening of the diabetic control. So it's very important that we're aware of this and that we're thinking about this when patients with diabetes present to the hospital. His chest x-ray changes are much more subtle. He's got a little bit of bilateral change, but it's not significant. And he required two liters of oxygen at most during his hospital stay. He wasn't acidotic, but was compensating for a significant metabolic disturbance. He was treated with fluids and sugar because there was an element of starvation ketoacidosis, but his ketones persisted at around about one, and he required the uh, introduction of subcutaneous insulin. The last case is a case of a man from an institution. In this case, this man was in prison, but we've had a number of patients who have presented from other institutions, such as care homes, where elderly patients are presenting with coronavirus. Again, this gentleman presented with a classical triad of pyrexia, cough, and breathlessness. He was significantly hypoxic. He had multiple medical comorbidities, and again, presented with respiratory failure and basal crepe. Again, he has subtle changes in his right lung and more diffuse changes in his left lung. He deteriorated on the ward with slightly worsening respiratory uh, symptoms and a repeat chest stitchery didn't show a great deal of change radiologically. This man had multiple comorbidities. He'd had previous hospitalizations where he'd not tolerated medical interventions particularly well and we were always concerned about whether he would tolerate level two treatments. A decision was taken, as we've had to take with many of our patients, that even level two therapies would not be appropriate. He had persistent fever and escalating oxygen requirements. He was already anticoagulated, full anticoagulation because he had paroxysmal AF, so we didn't need to explore the possibility of a pulmonary embolism because he was already receiving treatment for that. Unfortunately, he did not recover, but required significant doses of morphine and midazolam, both to help him tolerate treatment with a normal face mask, and then ultimately to ensure that his symptoms were controlled. So I think that in summary, the challenges that we're facing are in diagnostics, in the management of respiratory failure, and I think that the consensus is moving back towards that the majority of patients have conventional ARDS and should be treated as such in intensive care units. We should be vigilant for thrombosis, and vigilant for metabolic disturbance. And for all our patients, we should be considering infection control issues and how we set up our hospitals and our teams to, to maximize this. And for a majority of our patients who are not going to get home, we need to think about how we manage their end of life issues. And that includes not just managing the patient, but also the family. We're living in a time now where we are limiting the number of visitors to the hospital but we need to be holistic in how we deal with patients and their families at this time. And we've got a clinical director who's a very tall man, and uh, we would uh, recommend that uh, social distancing is an important uh, role, both within and without the hospital, and we would advise everyone to stay one big run apart. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Paul Kadin for this very, uh, uh, very informative lectures and uh, slides from the Dr. Paul Kadin from the United Kingdom. And I will uh, transfer the uh, microphone to my friend, the, the second uh, moderator in our morning sessions, Dr. Uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Abbas Fadl to present the second speaker from the United Kingdom, my close friend and the honest one, Dr. Madar al Khair Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan Kareem, kulli aam wa antum khair. The second speaker is a well-known figure in the respiratory medicine. As he is a senior consultant of respiratory medicine. Uh, our colleague and friend and brother, Dr. Mother Khairallah, all of uh, together. He working in the Diqab Lung Disease Center and Taisid University Hospital Trust. He will talk about how the United Kingdom handled patients with COVID-19. Started, Dr. Mother. Thanks. Very good. 
Thank you kindly for the kind introduction. And I think we've adopted uh, Dr. Paul Cadden as another brother for Iraq, inshallah. Um, I'm sure that he will have many appearances in the future if I keep haggling and nagging him to give us some talks on respiratory medicine. Um, I will try to keep the time uh, so that we would allow uh, opportunity for questions at the end. Um, essentially, my topic is going to be about how the UK handled COVID-19. There are now published data and articles in the, in, 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 in the public uh, media that have highlighted quite a, you know, a success as far as NHS Tayside was concerned when dealing with COVID-19 and the NHS as a whole. But I would say that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been a humbling experience across the Western world, including advanced care settings in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and many other regions, including Italy and Spain. So what we'll be talking about today is just the, an overview of the pattern of the disease, initial response to the pandemic, and the unlocking of the lockdown, um, how, how tricky that can be to implement, and then the lessons that we learned from this experience. So as you guys know, and I think it's, it's now known to every single person living across the globe, that the SARS-2 COVID-19 started in Wuhan province in China. That was when the first uh, re reported cases were on 31st of December in 2019. There have been some anecdotal cases reported early in December, earlier in December in France, but that I think I, I don't, I'm not sure how established that is. Um, the World Health Organization on the 30th of January. Uh, issued a public health emergency and on the 11th of February they, they named the SARS-2 as COVID-19 and then on the 11th of March as many people anticipated as there was a 13-fold increase in cases across many regions across the world the, the, the definition of a pandemic or jaiha was given to COVID-19. There is of course as we know uh, the big problem that we have with pandemics uh, in the past and in, in the current is that they have a massive impact on social and the economy of any nation and any continent. And that has been an absolutely uh, awful issue. Uh, this morning, it is estimated that one fifth of the workforce in the United States are applying for bailouts because they are out of pocket. Uh, and this is absolutely unprecedented in, 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 the, in, in history and in, in, our, in, in our existence. Uh, most of them have been brought to a standstill and there's also a lockdown risk that you increase the mortality in non-COVID disease if you're not careful. COVID-19 is, 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 an, is an RNA virus that is actually um, has been rather puzzling and uh, quite a nasty disease. Um, that's because it has, when you compare it to the seasonal flu, for example, if you look at the infectivity, it's, it is a lot more infective. Um, and, and indeed, many of our patients who have coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, have no symptoms. The RO number, which is the estimate of how many people will be infected by an average individual with a disease, is 1.3 for flu, but it's much higher with COVID-19, two, two and a half. Uh, some, figure, some, some studies show a higher figure. There's a higher virulence, there's higher mortality. Uh, you can see that the incubation time from exposure to first symptoms is about one to four days with the flu, whereas it's one to 14 days with the COVID-19, so there's more opportunity for this highly uh, infective uh, organism to spread. Um, when they talk about herd immunity, of course, it would be acceptable when you have a hospitalization rate of 2% compared to 19% with COVID-19, and more importantly, the case fatality is less than 0.1% in flu, whereas it's one to 3.4%. So when it comes to the flu, when it comes to chickenpox, it would be acceptable to have herd immunity, but not when it comes to something like COVID-19 with such a high case fatality. It's a multi-system disease, and uh, I think uh, Paul illustrated this really nicely in his slides. So you can see that a lot of patients, they can have normal plain radiography, of course, but in, in when you go to high resolution CT scan or conventional CT scans with lung uh, windows, you can see that one of the classical features is consolidation that is subfloral, <coughs> sorry, that is in the periphery and at times spares the, the subfloral region. But it can present with any pattern, to be honest. Uh, there are other features as well as highlighted in the previous case that uh, there, there are cases with thromboembolic disease. There's myocarditis recently identified up to 25% of cases. 
There's also skin manifestations and recent data has shown that we could even find it in, in, in semen and in the peritoneum in some surgical cases. Now, the World Health Organization uh, launched the COVID-19 global collaboration. And as mentioned in the introduction to this uh, great symposium, that the globalization uh, has helped uh, spread information and improve collaboration uh, between us. Uh, and that's been great. And the politics, of course, is always going to be involved because different countries will have, um, you know, some, some, of the, some of the politics will, will, will impact on robust, reliable scientific data due to many other factors, including the economy and, uh, and, and whatever um, elections are coming up. Uh, one of the biggest studies that looked at um, uh, features of COVID-19 was done in the UK. Uh, it was headed by a team in Liverpool, and they looked at uh, just shy of 17,000 hospitalized UK patients with COVID-19. And uh, basically, you can see in this uh, plot here that uh, it's predominantly, it's more, it, it's higher, the proportion of it is higher in males, and there are also, in the, it's more, it's also in, more in the elderly population that would be at risk of dying. The reason why it's, it's higher in males and in the older population is because the uh, SARS-CoV-2 binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, 2 receptor, which is less abundant in children and in women. There are other scientific reasons for it as well. Um, it gives you conventional flu-like symptoms uh, and chest symptoms of so cough, fever, breathlessness, as alluded to, but it also can give you many other symptoms, including gastrointestinal symptoms of vomiting and diarrhea in a significant proportion of about 20-25%. There is a lot of cardiovascular comorbidity with these patients who don't fare too well with COVID-19. That's what we found in the study. And in terms of the results of the study, uh, out of 16,749 patients in 166 hospitals, you can see that a third died. So this is a severe disease. So if the patients re reach hospital, uh, it, it, it can be a very high risk of mortality. Those who are admitted to level two care in HDU settings um, have a just shy of a 50% death rate. And those in mechanical ventilation, more than 50, well, more than 50%, 53% actually died. And the 27% remaining in hospital, a good proportion of them would have gone on to pass away, unfortunately. So this is a, this is a deadly disease that has to be taken seriously. And you can see that there are strong hubs uh, in, the, in the UK, predominantly in London, southeast London, uh, the West Midlands, uh, in the north of England, uh, around Yorkshire, Manchester, Liverpool, in Glasgow, and in Northern Ireland as well. So we've had some quite really quite nasty uh, pockets of disease. We're located here in Tayside. Uh, we haven't had it as bad as the rest of the United Kingdom. And um, on the 11th of May, the statistics in terms of how many people were reported or registered as dead or confirmed COVID-19 was 32,000. I think now the number is above 34,000, the highest in Europe in terms of rate and absolute number uh, recorded. It's difficult, of course. It's, it's, it's quite easy to sort of criticise um, whether the UK did badly or how they approached the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, you can see that the aim of a lot of our, uh, a lot of countries was to basically bring down the curve, as you can see, quite successfully done in South Korea and New Zealand. There are other countries that have had success, including Germany, but in the United States, in United Kingdom, and Sweden, it hasn't been as successful. It has, there has been a delay in getting that curve down, and that's due to a number of reasons. There's a low threshold for, to take serious measures. And they, I think there was a, a, you know, although I think the NHS maintained its capacity really well and contingent plans and plans B, et cetera, was done really well with the NHS and it was well protected in the United Kingdom. But I think they were slow to take up um, uh, you know, weight result in isolation and lockdown measures in order to prevent the disease from spreading. Um, there is a, there's an element where some of the countries that have a tendency to quite rightly wait for evidence uh, results or complex models before they would implement any practice can be penalized when you have a rapid pandemic spreading the way that COVID-19 was spread and it was an unknown entity. And I think the UK has, has had, um, you know, uh, across the globe, um, the fortune and the 
let's, let's, one would say the, pre the prestige of only doing things when there's a good evidence base, but sometimes evidence base takes time and time means life as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Strong and early lockdown was certainly necessary and some of the author authoritarian states like China, for example, probably had it easier to implement compared to the United Kingdom. And some had to isolate away from home in these countries, not the case in the UK. There, are, there was strong travel restrictions. The face masking and distancing we can discuss, but um, it's variable how effective that is. And I underline testing because that is quite crucial. We are probably across the globe underreporting the number of death, the death toll across. And in Russia, it is estimated that it could be 70% higher than the official figures. Um, and that's sometimes due to uh, political reasons. Um, when we say countries have done well, um, we have to qualify that because it, it, there are variable public health measures and there are complex social, political, genetic and environmental factors that play a role in all of this. Um, sometimes you can underestimate the impact of COVID-19 and I think uh, easing of restrictions like what has happened recently in Iraq might actually be a negative thing as we've seen the recent surge in numbers in pockets of Baghdad. But as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, I think the things that were done well, eventually the lockdown measures were done and most people were compliant with it. There was excellent NHS capacity uh, with surplus of uh, level three care ventilators. Um, it, there was a very good initiative from the government to bail out the taxpayer uh, through a scheme called the furlough scheme by paying them 80% of their salary up to 2,500 pounds a month. Their scientific contribution has been immense as far as the United Kingdom is concerned. Um, they've contributed to treatment research and unfortunately so far there has been a lack of definitive treatment as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Um, there are disease patterns which the UK has identified and contributed to identifying and of course it's working really hard on the race to developing a vaccination. I think there have been things that could have been, been done better as far as the United Kingdom is concerned. As I said earlier, lockdown the personal protective equipment wasn't readily accessible and it wasn't necessarily the highest quality, but I think that was across a problem across the globe. Perhaps with the free press, you would hear it and hear about it a lot more in countries such as the United Kingdom. But I think it has been an issue with a lot of countries. Uh, I think they quickly avoided the herd immunity theory. Uh, as I pointed out before, that the mortality, the case mortality for this is just too high for us to go down the route of herd immunity. And it, also, it would also reduce the capacity in the National Health Service, so you had to flatten out that curve. There's clearer guidance during easing of lockdown that they have introduced. I'm sorry, they need to, they could have done it better. They, they haven't produced clear guidelines as far as easing of lockdown is concerned. And, and I highlight testing. When it comes to testing, if you look at Germany, for example, they were, last week, they were, uh, they had a capacity for testing more than 800,000 samples per week compared to the UK on the 13th of May that wasn't able to provide testing in less than 100,000 cases per day. Um, so it's, it, it's quite difficult, um, I think, to, because it took us time to sort of provide a much higher capacity for testing compared to counterparts in Germany and South Korea. Well, with regards to the unlocking of the lockdown, that can be quite tricky. And you're, what, what you're trying to do is avoid the inevitable uh, surge. That surge will happen, I think, across all countries. But we, what, what we would like to do is to see a small surge, not a massive surge, because that would be truly devastating. The challenge would be in terms of delaying that surge and reducing its amplitude would be uh, the delay in vaccination, the lack of definitive treatment, reinfection rate, and that there is more than one COVID-19 genotype, which might make it a little bit tricky to develop a vaccine. And the, the studies have shown that in the absence of a vaccination or treatment, it can take nine waves of infection. So that's a second, third, fourth surge, etc., to achieve herd immunity, which is quite a long time. There are public health principles that we should be aware of. So that in terms of easing of restrictions, they, they have to be clear and gradual. The infection status and the incidence that I mentioned earlier, the R number is crucial. It has to be less than one, but that's not the only thing that we would measure. Doubling time, contact tracing and testing is crucial. Community acceptance in terms of engaging with the new normal and different ways of 
adapting our culture to engage with this, the public health capacity, and of course, the health system capacity. This is an example of what we're, the time trajectory, as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, published on the 11th of May. So we're looking at the end of May, primary schools might open, end of June secondary schools and cafes might open, end of August, uh, restaurants might open, and from October, if the rate of coronavirus cases is low, all remaining areas will be open uh, and the, the economy can truly reopen. We are probably between stages four and three at the moment, the UK current position, and it's really important that we move very slowly towards stage one. It will probably fluctuate between these rather than a smooth ride to, 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 to number one. There have been apps developed um, on mobile devices to help with contract tracing, etc., and uh, to, to trace where people, but there hasn't, really, there hasn't been really a great take up of this. So in summary, and uh, we've had a high death rate in the United Kingdom, unfortunately, there has been excellent NHS capacity, poor support for care homes, and delaying the lockdown process, I think. There should be mass testing and it should have happened earlier. So the lessons learned for better preparedness in the future is test, trace, and isolate. And I think with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mudar. Very nice, interesting uh, subject and very informative for uh, this uh, happened in UK. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mudar. Pleasure. Thank you very much to Dr. Paul Kaden from United Kingdom and Dr. Mudar Zakil Khairallah, uh, also from the United Kingdom. And we start the uh, discussion panel. We have uh, uh, 20 minutes for the discussion panel. Any questions to Dr. Paul Kaden and Dr. Mudar al Khairallah? Uh, please put in the, uh, the, such, the section of the uh, questions and answer. And we have two, answers, two questions now. The first one, what, uh, what, the, what are the mechanisms of thrombocytopenia in patients with severe COVID-19 symptoms? and how can differentiate it as a cause of disease itself or a side effect of hydroxychloroquine in the follow-up of the uh, patients? Um, I uh, think you hear me, Dr. Mudar? Yeah, the short, the short answer we think is that um, the, fr the thrombosis tendency is probably multi multiple mechanisms. So I don't think there's one single mechanism that the hematologist would come back to us to say, this is the, this is the reason that we're seeing thrombosis and, and, and we are, await further information about that. And, and we're desperately interested in working that out because that will direct us to what the best therapy is. And that's one of the reasons why we don't want to go for full dose uh, anticoagulation at the moment because there's bleeding risk with that. And there is, um, there is concern that actually that might not be the correct agent and that we may need to look at other, uh, other antiplatelet therapies and other things. So um, the short answer is uh, don't know probably more than one mechanism. Certainly with the amount of thrombosis we're seeing, a consumptive thrombocytopenia is certainly part of this. Uh, in terms of the, the secondary question of hydroxychloroquine side effects, um, we have we have not routinely used hydroxychloroquine in the UK. Uh, I think that goes across the board, but particularly here in Tayside. We have been involved in the uh, recovery trial, which has hydroxychloroquine uh, as part of that treatment arm. But I think that our scientist, Professor Chalmers, who is our, our lead academic respiratory physician uh, and on the board of the ERJ, um, I think he has been, uh, guiding us towards the fact that, you know, we haven't got good evidence for hydroxychloroquine. I think that observational studies of compassionate use uh, may be misleading. Um, and again, that's the UK, as Mudder has said, that's in the UK, we're taking the approach that we want to wait for the evidence. I think we understand why people are using these agents um, because we want our patients to get better. But I think our feelings are that these agents have potential for serious side effects and until we've got good evidence of efficacy, I think we're not there yet in terms of their routine use. So 
we've seen lots of thrombocytopenia and we're not using hydroxychloroquine. So I guess it's the disease rather than the drug, but we probably can't tell if you're using that agent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bauer. And the second question for Dr. Mother, hi. Uh, the answer is said hi. Uh, what are the precautions that prevent infection with the virus in the absence of a vaccination? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Barton. Uh, I mean, looking at the question here, I think what they're asking is hi, does precaution prevent infection with the virus in the absence of vaccination? I, yes. will try and, I will try and answer both, uh, just for benefit. So in terms of prevention, um, it, 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 the best way of preventing this is that has got most scientific data behind it is regular hand washing. This is a droplet spread, more than aerosol spread, depending on what machinery you use. And when it comes to droplet spread, it means that contamination, the door handles, etc., like other places. So wearing gloves, potentially washing hands regularly, would probably would probably be the best. I think in terms of prevention. In terms of wearing masks, etc., there isn't a strong scientific evidence behind it, but they do recommend it. I think with a lot of anecdotal evidence in places places where you cannot maintain the two meter distance. In terms of whether the precautions would prevent infection with the virus in the absence of a vaccination, they, they certainly help. But what you have in the midst of a pandemic, the way that you could do that is not just through precaution. The, realistically, you would have to ensure something such as a lockdown and restriction to, the, to, to society. And that has enormous um, uh, knock-on effects on the economy. So having a vaccination in place, whenever that vaccination occurs, would probably uh, speed up um, the herd immunity required um, with less death. I think you need to unmute. Yes, sir. Thank, as, thank you, Dr. Mother. Uh, as we know, the Sweden depend on herd immunity, but we didn't hear any figure of the infection from this country. Yes. If you know this, yes. any figure? Yes, there are, there, there, there haven't been, Sweden has, has adopted something that the overwhelming majority of nations have avoided. And that's through some infection control measures in society, but allowed herd immunity to take place. I don't think they had, because they have, they already have a background of an excellent healthcare service with great capacity. From that, with, with, with regard to that, and being extremely selective of who would qualify for level three care, we haven't seen the, a true bottleneck when it comes to the healthcare service across the media channels. However, looking at what is recorded and what they've measured in terms of COVID-19 cases, along with the UK, that was slow in implementing lockdown measures and the United States, you see that the curve in Sweden is also slow to come down. And they've had a huge, large number of deaths compared to the same period last year and the year before in, in March, April, May. So I think they've adapted the herd immunity, but they, they will have, they will get away with the bottleneck as far as capacity is concerned, but it will cause a lot of death. Thank you, Dr. Mother. Uh, please, for uh, attendance and uh, participant, any questions, uh, please put in the uh, question and answer. Note in the chart, please. Put the, any questions you have in the question and answer. The, uh, so, right. so we've, got, we've got one last question here. Oh, oh sorry, no, we're not scrolled down. So um, the regime that we're currently using in the UK is we are recommending that patients are enrolled in clinical trials such as recovery. So um, recovery um, has a control arm with no additional treatment. And then it's got resdenosvir, prednisolone, and hydroxychloroquine. Um, and also it has a second arm where you can then be randomized to tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 for patients who are still unwell a few days after initial randomization. So 
Uh, that's again been a global study and we're delighted to be part of that. Um, and I think that you know, the number of patients in that trial, we would hope that within the next month, we're gonna get a clear steer with really good high quality data. Um, in terms of actually the supportive treatments, so supporting recovery, um, oxygen, but um, aiming for saturations of 90 to 92%. There was concerns at the beginning of this of how hospital oxygen supplies would cope if every patient in the hospital was on high flow oxygen. Um, and, and the answer is that they wouldn't um, because of the physics of the, of the pipes. So we've aimed for lower oxygen saturation targets. And we've also uh, chosen CPAP as our rescue respiratory therapy. And we're also very interested in proning patients on level two. So awake proning has been something that we've been using um, essentially to try and avoid invasive ventilation because as Mudder showed from the UK data, um, if you end up intubated on an intensive care unit, um, your chance of survival is approximately one in four to one in five. Um, and that's not good odds uh, compared to uh, normal ICU outcomes. So um, we have, we've adopted a, a supportive uh, therapy, uh, but um, provide, you know, we've, we, we increased our capacity of level three beds sixfold and our level two beds, uh, we also increased our capacity by about four times. So we, we provided the capacity if the wave had been substantial that we would have been able to offer that level of care to vastly more people than we were actually needed to do in the end. Yeah, so the next question, I mean, I think that would be a cardiologist with pediatric interest, but we will, uh, there is certainly, I mean, the question is about from Hassan and Ghali, any data about pediatrics in this Kawasaki-like presentation is specifically affected children. It's certainly not specific to children, but there's been a much higher proportion of children reported across the globe, and we've seen it in London as well, um, with the typical presentation of Kawasaki, but it's disproportionate to the usual incidence of Kawasaki. So there has certainly been reports of this, and they would be treated the conventional way that Kawasaki is treated. Uh, I think there is an associated increased mortality rate with Kawasaki, live presentation of specific affected ch children. Um, the next question from Mohammed Basim, I think, um, that regarding the nine generations required to develop a herd immunity, how long could that take in terms of months or years? It's very difficult to measure that. It's a very good question. Uh, it's very difficult to measure that because that would sometimes rely on how long it takes before it, we get the next surge and how big that surge is going to be. So it's not just an absolute number of surges, but it's how big they are and how spaced out they are between them. Perhaps, I think some scientists have estimated a period of 18 months to 24 months in the absence of a vaccine that might need nine generations that it would take that long. So it would take a longer period of time. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the, uh, uh, do we need to uh, bronchial lavage all the patients? I think from an infection control point of view, the answer to that is no, protect your staff. Uh, limit the number of contacts between staff and patients as much as possible and uh, use clinical acumen and the nasopharyngeal combined oropharyngeal front swab uh, to maximize your chances of making a diagnosis uh, from that route. Um, there will always be cases where we have high clinical suspicion uh, and there will be patients where you know that they are inevitably going to end up on the ventilator. And if they're going to onto a ventilator, then you can get a deep sample at that point. Um, we have, we have great, basically got a clean critical care department. Uh, we have a uh, COVID critical care department. And then we have our admission unit, which has negative pressure side rooms where we are delivering level two care. So you need to isolate your patient if you don't have a confirmed swab. And um, we would say treat them in an isolated side room with appropriate precautions rather than proceed to an endobronchial uh, wash and lavage uh, on the basis that you don't want your respiratory physicians and bronchoscopists to become ill uh, and then not be able to treat a larger cohort of patients. So you have to protect your staff. Um, the next question from Ali Adil Sharif is easy to, easy to answer. I have a diagnosed child with Kawasaki disease 10 days ago. Should I send him for COVID-19 PCR? 
um, definitely should. But a negative result doesn't mean that they don't have COVID-19, but they might still be uh, shedding viral uh, materials that you would be able to get a, a, a positive diagnosis. So I would definitely contemplate isolating the child and, 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 and uh, if they have ongoing symptoms and getting them tested for COVID-19 PCR. And also the um, serology tests that appear to be now just about to hit uh, prime time in terms of uh, mass capacity for rollout. So I think I think we're going to have serology within the next month to six weeks that we will be able to use in these types of cases too. Uh, again, I don't know how that's going to be rolled out across the globe, but I suspect that it will be something that we will have available to us relatively soon. Um, we have, well, we've presented cases of patients with uh, negative swabs who've had active disease requiring intensive care. So I think we've answered that question. Um, the haematologists are interested in plasma, uh, and again, they're running a trial of this. Uh, so uh, I haven't, I, I, the Zoom didn't work for the, when the haematologist was telling us about that, so I haven't heard them talk about it, but I know that they're doing it. Um, there was a case uh, of encephalitis in Nan. There's a case of encephalitis registered in the UK related to COVID-19. Could we discuss it? I mean, it's, it's a case where they had a typical, uh, I read about the case, it was basically a case that uh, a patient developed, developed fatal features of encephalitis and was found to be COVID positive. I think there were some uh, features on their uh, MR imaging that correlated with other sort of pattern of MR imaging COVID-19 infection found and published across the globe. And that's why they thought that the COVID-19 and the encephalitis were potentially related. It's a coronavirus at the end of the day, and corona can cause encephalitis. It's not just herpes simplex. Um, is there a difference between DIC of COVID-19 and DIC of non-COVID-19? You don't get DIC with COVID-19. There is a big difference, of course. DIC is a separate entity. You can get DIC in severely unwell patients due to COVID-19 who end up in intensive care, who develop multi-organ hyperperfusion and failure then you can get the conventional DIC. But even the pattern we usually get with uh, DIC that with defined DIC is often not seen necessarily with, 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 the, with the COVID patients. And then the, the, the next question, which is, can you catch it um, twice? I think uh, that's an interesting question because it's certainly come up as a topic of debate as we've had a number of healthcare workers that tested positive about a month ago. And then, um, have had household contacts with viral illnesses and pyrexia and uh, what do you do? Do you have to self-isolate? I think the evidence from Korea was that um, the, uh, the cases that they thought were presentations of second, second disease were in fact false positives in their lab uh, and uh, weren't true positive cases. So I think that the answer is we don't truly know because we don't know what the level of immunity that people will get. Coronavirus doesn't often confer strong immunity. So uh, scientifically potential, but actually in reality, I think that with asymptomatic transmission, I think that uh, somebody is unlikely to get uh, the virus twice and be a, a, a vector for others. I think we're more likely to worry about the, the people that have never had the disease. Um, we've got about one. We've got one minute left. I've done my usual timer. So, shall we answer the la final questions? Are we? Are you guys happy? Dr. Abbas and Mr. Abbas. Dr. Mudar, you have a uh, five minutes. Uh, so the, the next question from Father Hussein. So if there's plasma, but did he answer that one? Uh, well, I, I think that, that we defer to the haematologist yeah. to come back to us with the trial result. I think yeah. that's a repetition of a uh, previous point. Yeah, but that, I mean, with regards to, 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 to plasma treatment, the, the, the target that they would probably have are those who end up requiring respiratory support. These are, they will be the target patients. As like Paul said, yeah, we don't know, we don't, we don't have the evidence for it. No one knows the answer in terms of timing, the ideal patients, that's why we've got trials ongoing. And then the next one, I think, the, thanks to you, Dr. Mudar. Some senior mm -hmm. after postpartum study suspected the cause of death is DIC rather than pneumonia. What's your opinion? It depends on the case scenario. I would need to know the case exactly to give an opinion about a specific case and what the cause of death was. And I think that the literature from the pathology post-mortem studies is that um, they've gone back and they've looked 
Um, and there's certainly a lot of local thrombo microthromboses in the lung. But again, we don't know what the, um, the sort of uh, control cohort really has because they've gone back because they've had COVID to look really hard at all the blood vessels. Yeah. So and on second look, they found more microthrombosis. So I think that, again, the jury's still out on um, the exact mechanism of death. But I think that our intensive care colleagues would point us towards thrombosis being a common theme. Uh, and particularly with the amount of renal failure that they've seen in the UK, uh, in units in the UK, which again, uh, wasn't something that came out of necessarily the, the data that was being presented from China. So maybe different populations are having different pathological processes leading to death. So I think that um, it may well be that locally you're seeing slightly different things than we're seeing, but overall, I think that it's microthrombosis rather than DIC would be what the intensivists are suspecting. Um, we, we again have discussed blood pressure medications uh, at our m and meetings and our, our critical care meetings. So, sorry, that's the next question. So antihypertensive oh, no. drugs are harmful or protect for COVID-19 is a question Ramadan Mubarak too. Um, and the, the answer to that is they might be, they might not be. Again, we don't understand the disease trajectory um, because there is some evidence that these may be protective agents, um, but it may well do with when you take them in relation to the virus um, enveloping the receptor. So there's upregulation and downregulation of receptors after infection, and therefore there's potential that um, agents could be both helpful and harmful. And I think um, until we've got bigger studies uh, and uh, um, We'll know this when we look back on it in a year. I've said that often in many of our meetings. We don't know yet. We're making the best decisions with the data we've got. But actually, we're, the advice from the societies are to do what we would normally do. So if they've got renal failure and acute kidney injury, stop their antihypertensives. If they don't, carry them off. So they're asking about whether, in terms of achieving accuracy of our diagnosis, they're asking Dr. Paul. Yeah, so, uh, so the, 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 the blood data from, from the Chinese study was that there was very low levels of viremia, um, and certainly it's not been uh, routine to do uh, PCR for blood. Um, we, have, we have not tried to overload the radiology department with uh, frequent CT scanning. Um, our surgical colleagues are vastly worried about this. Uh, and certainly we have seen radiological change of COVID in surgical patients who are asymptomatic. So CT is certainly a diagnostic tool, but I think it's about putting together the history of the patient, the clinical examination findings, and the investigations. I think medicine hasn't changed. History first, examination second, test third. Um, um, although we're in the 21st century, I think that should still be the order of attack. Um. Another question from Haida Khamis, the one before last. Uh, thanks to the mother. Depending on, on, on your investigation, what percentage of cases suffer from vomiting and diarrhea and can be considered a major clinical sign for COVID 19? Absolutely, based on the study that was done in the UK, uh, less than 20%, so about between 5 and 25%, had uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, vomiting, and diarrhea, et cetera, which you get with the flu, of course, and other viruses, and with the non. the, the, uh, the, the the previous coronavirus, the novel one. And so I think it would be reasonable that if somebody presents like this in the midst of a pandemic that you should screen for COVID-19. Does that increase screening? Yes. Does that have a lower threshold? Yes. Does that cause a problem when you have gastroenteritis problems endemic in your region? Definitely. But we are in a pandemic. Uh, the, the final question, I think, was around from the prophylaxis and what our current guidelines are. So our local hospital guideline has not changed. So we are most medical patients fill the criteria for thromboprophylaxis, and we did an audit of this, and we were achieving good levels of thromboprophylaxis for our patients, uh, and we are recommending that we are vigilant and making sure that that occurs. Uh, we are also asking people to be very vigilant for in patients that are deteriorating, considering a PE as a possibility. Uh, mother uh, talked about myocarditis, and we certainly had cases of pericarditis. We've had a number of patients present with paroxysmal AF in the context of their illness. Um, so locally, we have not dose-adjusted for weight or uh, comorbidities in London. 
there seems to be a recommendation that if you are a heavier patient with uh, type 2 diabetes, then you should be considered for double dose thromboprophylaxis. So that's a twice daily regime. Um, I don't think anyone in the UK is regularly full dose anticoagulating uh, people. Um, the feeling is that yes, when they get to intensive care, the intensivists may be doing that, but the disease process perhaps has already begun and actually you may just be exposing them to harm rather than benefit at that stage. But that's why we want to conduct a study and that's what's actually happening. There is a study going on about uh, anticoagulation with COVID. Last question, is there a role for serum in managing COVID type patients? The short answer is based on evidence so far, no. فضيناهم كل الأسئلة. دكتور مضارع شكرا شكرا جزيلا. Thank you very much to thank you very much to دكتور باول and دكتور مضار from the United Kingdom for this nice share in our conference and I hope for them the health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The second part, the second part of uh, our uh, morning session for our uh, conference is the uh, COVID-19 effect on gastrointestinal endoscopy from Syria. Professor Dr. Faiz Sandouk is a FRCP, United, United Kingdom endoscopist and gastroenterologist. for months I've been out of Iraq you know that I used to come every uh, month uh, I come a week to, uh, to work in Al Kafir I really missing terribly missing the area especially Karbala and Al Hawzat and uh, Al Atabat so uh, I will uh, thank you, Faiz Khalaf, my uh, dear son. Thank you, the the card who gave me for giving me the uh, the chance of uh, being with you. Uh, I will share you now. Uh, here we are. Taya Subhi. Okay. I will share you the screen. I will be talking about. Uh, do you have the slides? Do you have the slides? Naam, Dr. Faz. Naam. Okay, yeah. So 12, Dr. Faz. Okay. You have okay. the slides, okay? Yes. That's very good. Slides? Yes, okay. Okay? Okay, Ready? okay, Dr. So okay. This is you just to give you uh, the idea. This is my new center that's going to open in a month, inshallah, in Syria. Syrian Specialty Hospital, private hospital for gross intestinal endoscopy. In a month's time, inshallah, I invite you all of you to come over. Uh, I'll be talking about the COVID. What the endoscopy units should know about the COVID? It's very important. On the first slide, I, I have some comment on it. As you could see from Ward. Uh, WHO and rather new and we have we can appreciate that most of the cases came now in uh, the developed country at one developed country and uh, saving the poor countries that been that had been suffering for a long time I have no comment maybe not everybody uh, come uh, agree with me uh, I really uh, I'm so grateful to COVID because uh, just uh, let us, our country, uh, have some break out of those uh, difficult countries that have been uh, surrounding, killing us. And it just came like a uh, punishment for them, just to give us a break. Uh, I'm sorry, this is my uh, impression. Uh, and I'm sure most of uh, our people share this impression because we've been having this very bad 10 years uh, of struggle. Uh, 
the second slide again from WHO, we can see the total uh, cases uh, within the same period, uh, about one million and a half almost now. I read it yesterday. It's over even four million and a half, and the deaths uh, about 300,000. The risk patients of us are the high risk patients are all age and immunosuppressed. <coughs> John Hopkins had very beautiful a quick decision for everybody to deal with the thing that we, the uh, uh, the doctors, need to know uh, in order to continue in my specialty, which is the GI. So uh, it's COVID, as we everybody knows now, it's not a living organism; it's not killed. So it decays itself by its own, and uh, it's just a simple DNA uh, covered with very weak layer of uh, lipid that we wash very easily by all kinds, uh, many kinds of uh, uh, soaps, antiseptic, etc. As long as it increases the alcohol more than 65%, you need 20 seconds washing and then everything will be clean. And this is very the key of actually prophylaxis for to stop the pandemic things. <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, this uh, it, it mainly goes this virus to eye, nasal, and to the throat, where from there goes into the lung. And uh, it, when this integrate, it depends. The, in this integration depends on the temperature, on the humidity, and the type of material it's, uh, it's ly lying on. Mainly, like for example, the uh, wood it takes more rather lo longer time than than iron, etc. So. It, it, uh, other, it, it, uh, in all cases, it has, uh, it has, uh, it, it decayed itself, decayed itself in, in no time. Uh, the, the, uh, the virus enters from, as we said, from the nose, mouth, and the eyes into the, into the lung. Subsequently, uh, one third of them ha might develop diarrhea. And uh, about 10% uh, of uh, hospital uh, infection are comes from this, uh, it goes to the staff. So the highest infected and uh, the highest infected medical staff are from the ICU staff, the chest people, and then uh, we are the GI people uh, come in the first stage, in the uh, first step. Uh, talking about COVID and endoscopy units, we talk about three main things. The endoscopy practice, the procedures we need to know. The, uh, please uh, put in your mind this uh, expression, uh, BPP, personal protection equipment is very important, and physician and nurses. Uh, it's uh, well known already that endoscopy uh, in general is aerosol procedures. And we might transfer with this, uh, again, WHO, they found that uh, uh, if, if you suspect COVID, uh, then uh, we have to, to deal with it as uh, a procedure that aerosol generating. So definitely you have to be careful and uh, pay special attention, especially with the mask, special mask, called particularly the respirate, respirator mask, and this is calling about N95. This is the best mask type of mask. Uh, as you could see here, that the it, it, uh, this mask is very good for all kinds of organs and bugs. But the virus is 95% uh, that will protect you. The surgical uh, mask that we've been using all most of us in our centers, again, it has almost the same effect on the uh, on the virus cell. Yet it has less effect on the other bugs. So uh, for uh, when you have COVID, you can have both uh, uh, either of those two masks for COVID dealing with. Uh, the Chinese they created, excuse me, <coughs> the Chinese created so beautiful plastic box that, of course, at the Korean as well, they have the things, uh, the, the different types. It's a plastic completely, uh, uh, completely closed uh, uh, plastic box with uh, two orifices, one for inputs uh, that you can deal with for your manipulation uh, in respiratory system of the patient and one for the output to get out of the uh, of all the uh, secretions uh, the, this is when we go to the uh, what kind of practice what kind of procedure we're doing we have three types of course elective procedures in gi uh, urgent and emergency 
uh, the elective type should be canceled when we have the bandic band band uh, when you have the the bandic type you have to postpone all of those uh, elective things uh, and the screening uh, the follow ups the pre or post surgical so those, all of those things should be postponed postponed it. in our country it's not bandic it's just uh, pandemic it's just uh, in our country it's uh, simple cases we never reach not only us actually most of the this poor country they uh, uh, it's not, they haven't reached the, the pandemic type that, that express itself. Some uh, authorities, some media saying that uh, our, cover, our country is lying on to us. I told them it's, if it is pandemic, it will express itself. The, the man who's walking into, into the street will express himself. It suddenly collapses, etc. So it's, we do have the cases. We have in Syria only 55 cases and with, uh, with, with very good result of dealing with them on only three, three days. So, uh, so in, in, in this case, uh, so we, we're talking now, if we have this not pandemic case, uh, situation, we can uh, consider uh, two uh, cycles. We don't have uh, international studies yet, but we're doing it in Syria now, along with uh, our group and many of, in, I'm trying to get it in Iraq and in Jordan and in Egypt that there's no pandemic things. We, have, we need two cycles, you know, every cycle of, uh, of contamination is uh, for 14 days. So if we are able not to get uh, any more extra or single uh, 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 cases in the two cycle, which is one month, then we can say that we are controlling the things and uh, then we can start doing the elective things. But uh, to start with, when we started in March uh, uh, of this year, uh, we stayed for one month without any doing any elective cases. Uh, after then, we start. We, we went back to do the elective cases, and, and now uh, the uh, the urgent and emergency cases. We can. We, we of course we cannot stop them. We have to continue doing them, like the RCPs, cholangitis, stenting, like uh, the GI obstruction or bleeding, etc. So we should definitely not stop them. Yet we have to do our uh, precautions and uh, the best precautions the most importantly actually when you suspect a uh, 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 COVID patient is to take uh, get a temperature of every patient that we're going to do him and uh, to, we have to we have to minimize this is the steps to uh, minimize the number of attendants we only bring one attendant one uh, attendant of the patient and we should not come into the the uh, uh, we should stay out of, co of course the unit and uh, uh, with no relatives all patient uh, who has uh, let me see here it's in front of me a little bit oh okay uh, all the patients should have a uh, mask and gloves uh, before they get in and it's very important to leave space areas between uh, in, in the in the waiting area and between the patients and this is very important. For example, you, you can, uh, this, uh, it's either leave space like the, this, uh, the first slide, uh, Dr. Paul Shaw in, in, uh, in his slide, the last sentence should one, one meter between each attendant or patient, uh, or you can do, this is the way we took it from, uh, uh, from China, uh, that you do uh, the, the disc uh, vice versa, and uh, one meter between two uh, facing disc, otherwise we put uh, our backs to each other. So this is the way, uh, the way we do it in, in my rather small unit, yet I have so many uh, uh, patients, uh, people coming. So after we talk about the industrial practice, the things we do and the things we precaution for the location, and then we talk about the very important expression we call the PPE. PPE, personal protective equipment. We should take care of the equipment and the patients too. We divide the patient into two uh, main uh, high risk and low risk. The, the low risk patients, uh, they have no symptoms and uh, no history of exposure to COVID or to travel, no history of uh, COVID patient and no history of travel, uh, uh, recent travel, uh, more than 14 days. 
in high risk patients that had either symptoms, uh, typical symptom pulmonary symptoms, or it has uh, this story history of uh, COVID meeting people, patient or travel, or it has all of them. This is high risk patients. Uh, the difference between both of them uh, is that uh, actually we have we do the same prophylactic things except that the mass should be respiratory type uh, COVID-95 that we mentioned before uh, with two pairs of gloves, not only one glove. This is the main two difference between both of them. In addition, we uh, when we have the uh, uh, high risk patient, it's better to, uh, it's, it's a must actually, I don't have it in Syria, but uh, I don't have it because we don't have patient active, uh, COVID patient in my unit. Uh, but when we have a COVID patient, it should be negative pressure endoscopy room uh, with two doors. We, of course, every patient standardly, we take the temperature of them and uh, we, we, we follow his symptoms and uh, uh, we do intubation for even the standard, we're talking about the, the COVID patient, even for standard OGD emergency one, we do intubation for him, of course, chest X-ray and chest CT as well. This is the most things. Uh, this, this terminology in endoscopy should everybody knows about is donning and doving, dog and dog, don and dog. Don is the dressing and dog is getting off. Uh, as you can see, we start with this is the sta uh, st standard main thing. We start, it's, it should be in order things, hand hygiene first. Of course, uh, everybody by now knows the house. We'll see another uh, video at the end of it. Uh, then uh, we put the gown, then the mask, the type of mask, then face shield and gloves. And when you get rid of them, when we uh, dobbing, dobbing them, you go upwards just opposite. Uh, I will leave you with five minutes video. It's, it's important, right? it, although it's five, it's not boring. It's, it's of course, it's the ideal things when we have very high risk patients, COVID patients with pandemic. It's not, not in my center. But uh, I can, I'm doing most of those things, but this is for when you have isolated room. Excuse me. Okay.
دكتور فايز الصوت ما يوصل لنا مو طالع الصوت؟ اي ما طالع الصوت عندنا دكتور فايز اه والله ام سوري ممكن ممكن نتعلق على الموضوع اوكي بعلق ام سوري لا لا اوكي احطه يعني طبعا هذا مثل ما شفنا الادخال بس شوف الفويس عندي وين؟ اه اوكي اوكي هيك هيك واضح الصوت؟ لا يمكن شوي لو يعني صعد الصوت دكتور فايز الصوت مو واضح ما هيك مو واضح يعني ضعيف شوي الصوت ضعيف اوكي خلص طيب انا هل انا حش... ما احنا احنا اسفين انه يعني ما هي ما عرفت شلون تسوي المهم آه اوكي شفنا بس يمكن الشرح كان واضح آه بالنسبه للدخول آه انه المراحل الاربعه اللي حطيناها هون ستيب باي ستيب آه هون لانه الحاله آه هون دكتور فايز عفوا ماكو صوت معذرة نمسح الميوت نمسح الميوت دكتور فايز ماكو صوت عفوا دكتور فايز ممكن ترفع الميوت هيك ماشي الحال؟ ماشي اوكي ماشي ما هسه ماشي الحال دكتور صوت اوكي صوت واضح اوكي هسه تو رجع الصوت اوكي اوكي يلا سوري نحن طريقه سحب ال اكسكيوز مي شفنا طريقه سحب ال ال اظن ال الكلوبز كثير مهمه طريقه سحب الكلوبز اول شيء من الخارج بعدين الطلعه الثانيه هي طريقه سحب الكلوبز وبنحطهم طبعا في باقي كبيره الى اخره هي طريقه السحب عكس عكس السابقه وعمل لف واهم شيء ايدنا دازنت شط القسم الخارجي تبعه فقط نلفه من خلال القسم الداخلي فقط كمان نفس الشيء 15 او 20 ثانيه للاصابع بتعرفوا الطريقة هذه كله من ستوب الهادي اوكي اخر مرة نعيد الهايزن اجين مرة تانية I'm sorry for the things الصوت اذا نفس الشيء دوبينج اهم شيء الجلوبز الفيس مثل ما قلنا <تصفيق> هي طريقة السحب مرة تانية بنكتبه من الداخل انا طريقة شلح ال الجاون از فيري امبورتنت الدوبينج اللف المفروض الانر سايد اوف ات يكون تاتشينج ماي هاندز انا انا عم دقق شوي بهذه دكتور فايز لانه كثير مهم هي السيف في بي بي سي اي يعني بصير الستاف تبعنا بيكون ايفري بودي از كلين نرجع بنلبس الكفوف ومنطلق اوكي هلا الستيب الاخيره هي هاو تو تيك كير اوف ذا بيشنتس والنيرسز اوف كورس لازم يكون العمل تبعنا از تيم وورك وفي ثلاث شغلات اساسيه الشيء الاول هو المسافه بين الموظف الثاني يكون عاد بعاد عن بعضنا حوالي 1 متر الشغله الثانيه يكون فقط نجيب الستاف الضروري مو افري بودي يفوت لجوا الكلارك والكذا فقط الناس اللي كونسيرن بالاندوسكوبي واهم شيء نخفف الستاف تبعنا اللي عم يداوموا ما شرط كلهم يجوا بنحاول نعمل شفتات صغيره بشكل انه النمبرز اوف ذا ستاف يكونوا لو الفيلريت اتسيلف 
بدنا نخفف قدر الامكان المقاعد ما نخلي الناس او نعملهم بالطريقه اللي شفتوها مشان نمنع الجاذرينج وشغله فيري امبورتنت نو شيرنج اوف فونز بينز اتسترا ايفري بودي هاز هيز اون بين لان وخاصه الموبايلز واخيرا نعلم الطريقه المضبوطه الصحيحه لاستخدام اكسكيوز مي ام توكينج ان عربيك ام فيري سوري والله ام سوري يو هير مي الو الو سمعك دكتور فايز نسمعك تسمعوني مايك انا ام سوري اي واز توكينج ان عربيك ام سوري اوكي نو بروبليم اوكي سو ذا اتس فيري امبورتنت اي هوب ايفري ثينج واز بيت ان عربيك واز جود يعني So uh, uh, at the end, uh, when we have, if we have shortage of uh, PPI, uh, then we have to have three. Uh, the most, the target of our actually endoscopy is to protect our uh, uh, staff because we can help others. So uh, it's just like when. In the plane, you are playing, but to see if you have a everybody check you save yourself, you help yourself with the oxygen, then help the others. So, because we are the important guys that uh, we can continue the the uh, the project. So, it's very important in this case. We have shortage of uh, PPE. We have to, to protect the masks that we do have by using the face shields. Protect the eyes by using again. A Special or goggles, special glasses or shields, and we should uh, do uh, take care, uh, cover the all the decom decom uh, de contamination system. Uh, Korean and Chinese they're doing beautiful things. They're putting shield, plastic shields above uh, the machine, and uh, in order to uh, sterilize it after they finish. And again, the communication should be. We should work on. Daily update uh, the new recommendation and the availability of materials for and the staff. Uh, so, in summary, for endoscopy units and if we for endoscopy and COVID, we should work on two main targets: the endoscopy system, the endoscopy screening of patients should be postponed. We should adequate uh, do the adequate uh, PBD hand uh, hygiene and compliance of protocols and. Uh, Uh, in, in PBE system should be uh, transmission should be covered very properly with improved protection of the staff and lastly the safety equipment that we do have. This is the center I have as I show you this uh, first uh, uh, as place. This is our uh, uh, nurse. This is our actually GI, uh, not the GI, the anesthesiologist. Uh, she has. Uh, she had to talk to her husband or somebody, so she stayed by herself. Nobody seeing her. This is our group. This is our the uh, the dress we do during work, as we work. Uh, even uh, this is the the we were talking about the two secretaries that we have. They have the same business. Uh, I want to end with this so beautiful talk, actually, uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, his name, uh, everybody knows him, Majdi Yaqub. Uh, he, he, he gave this 10 advices for us. It's, أساطير سقطت عند أقدام كورونا. الفلوس قدام الفلوس. سقطت أسطورة الفلوس in front of the virus. Uh, again, uh, the... Uh, Uh, everybody stop it because it doesn't deserve it. Everybody is equal in front of the virus. Uh, I'm not important person more than uh, others anymore. Age, it doesn't mean anything in front of such things. So we have to catch the chance. على بالنا أقرب من أنفسنا الملكية again as well. Uh, nothing in front uh, of the العمل الذي ينفعك. Tomorrow, uh, if 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 turns from you, then you cannot compensate. Uh, the most important العلم, the science that we having, uh, we should use it in benefits. Uh, and دول عظمى سقطت أمامنا والتأمين إلى آخره. آخر سلايد حبيت أجيكم يا هذا هو of course مجدي يعقوب. Uh, actually, the coronavirus again, 
I'm so grateful for it because th these are the, the real uh, heroes all over the world are the medical uh, sincere stuff. And even the whole heroes, well known heroes, uh, raise their hat and uh, they uh, uh, respect uh, our uh, effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Dr. Faiz uh, Sanduk from Syria for this nice and uh, informative lecture. Uh, I'll the mic to Zamili Dr. Abbas. The last speaker in this morning session, uh, he, uh, our brother, uh, our colleague Dr. Dia Khalaf al Umari, he is assistant professor of medicine. He is senior consultant of internal medicine, Bikar Medical College. Uh, to uh, talk about handling of COVID-19 patient in Bikar, South of Iraq. Dr. Dia, can you start it? Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Faz, do you hear me, please? Stop sharing, please. Dr. Faz. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thanks for all. Uh, hello for everybody here and there. Uh, I want to talk with you uh, our story. My colleague, uh, Dr. Mother, talking about uh, the story from England. I will talk with you about our story from Tiqar in the south, from the south of Iraq. This is the location of our governorate in the south of Iraq. And let me tell you about our story, which is started in February 2020, where there are bad news coming from the east. What happened in the east? They say that there is a fatal infectious disease spreading from Wuhan in China, all over the world. It is reaching our borders. What is it? It is COVID-19 infection. Yeah. The new fatal disease, COVID-19 infection, is in new boring countries, and, he is in, and it is in our borders. When we hear this in body news, we started to think, yeah, we should think with our situation. We have 2 million population in our governorate. They will be at risk of getting the infection. So what we are doing, that's why we are thinking about this dangerous situation. Really, it is and it is a problem. And we are thinking, and before we are giving the solution, we sh should ask ourselves this question. Many questions arise in our mind. How many people will be infected in our governorate? Who will need hospitalization? And who will need an assisted ventilation? And the last but the question, what is the predicted mortality? Yeah, to answer these questions in our mind, we are asking here on there about the predicted numbers from the communities. The infection is spreading all over the world, in Asia, Europe, and even in the United States. They said at that time, 
at least 10 to 20 percent of the population may be infected. Oh, so what? That's mean around 200 to 400,000 of the people of my governorate will may get the infection. Someone say there are 80 percent of them will be asymptomatic. So what is the matter? In spite of 80 percent asymptomatic cases, but that's meaning that around 40 to 80 thousand may become symptomatic. A large number for our situation. Among those who become symptomatic, 10 percent, only 10 percent may get the severe infection. That's meaning that around four to eight thousand of our governorate population will get a severe infection. Half of them may need assisted ventilation. Oh my God. Two to four thousand will need assisted ventilation, and they have a, a risk of 80% mortality. Really, it is a bad thinking. So the expected number of mortality in our governorate, according to the least number, was 1,600 to 3,200 deaths. And should arrange, so we should arrange our plan for such catastrophe. Really, it was a catastrophe in our mind. Because some, they said that this number may be, may be doubled or troubled. So what we have for this battle, really it was a battle. What we have, how we prepare ourselves. We have only a few hospitals with limited bed capacities. We have just 22 ventilator can be increased up to 32. It is a sad news. It is a bad condition. We are thinking about that. But this, besides this, a bad idea, there is a good idea. What we have for this situation, we three teams, each one is headed by a consultant physician. It includes also pulmonologists, internal medicine senior, pediatricians, radiologists, and intensive care man and many volunteers from junior doctors and nurses. These are our fighters. Those are our fighters who fight or who decide to fight COVID-19 in the car in the south of Iraq. It is a good news that we are not receiving all these numbers, what we expect. We receive only 81 patients who are admitted till the 15th of May 22 in the car. And recently we have an other uh, five, added five patients uh, yesterday. Among those patients who are approved cases of COVID-19 by real-time BCR, there are 43 female and 38 male patient. This is with the ratio of female to male around one to one. Really, it is different from other governorate or the whole Iraq. In the whole Iraq, the male is a little bit higher than female ratio. In Iraq, they, in, in all Iraq governorates, they uh, calculate the uh, number of male or two female ratio, 55% of the infected person are male and 45% were female with a ratio of 1.2 to one male to female. In our governorate, a little bit differ. Uh, female are a little bit higher than male with a ratio of 1.1 to one female to male. With a different age, really we, we, we receive a different ages of patient. We receive, we, uh, the youngest patient 
was only 52 days age. And the oldest one was 103 year age. So uh, this diagram showed the uh, gender difference. It is uh, uh, 46.9 for male person, while the female patient uh, consists of only 53.1 uh, percent. Little bit female is higher than male, but I think, uh, we think that this uh, difference may be due to the small sample. And the large sample for all Iraq, uh, it was 55 percent for male and 45 percent for female. We are a young population, and most of our patients also, they are young. Only 13% of our patient was more than 65 years. And 11% is less than 13 per year old. Most of our patient in the, uh, are uh, ranging from 13 to 65. And the most commonly they are between between uh, 30 to 40, which is not differ from other governorate of Iraq. In Iraq, they found, in all Iraq, they found that the most age group which are affected by COVID-19, it was ranging from the age of 30 to 40. And only, only uh, 13 percent uh, in elderly person who are age more than uh, 65. How we handle those patients who are coming to you, we, uh, to our hospital with COVID-19 infection. We classify them either to be mild, moderate, severe, and critical. Those who are with only symptom of our respiratory tract infection just a fever or cough, they consider as a mild cases. While those with viral pneumonia and evidence of a clinical and radiological finding, especially glass ground appearance in the CT scan, bilateral, bilateral finding, bilateral pneumonia, bilateral infiltrate, peripheral infiltrate, they are considered as moderate. When there is a sign of severity, hypoxia, when the PO2 concentration in air room is less than 93, and when there is a respiratory failure, tachypnea, when, when the rate is more than 30, and other on the presence of lab finding of severity, really in our situation, we are sending our patient for a markers of the severity. We are using C-reactive protein, serum ferritin, troponin, D-dimers, and lastly, we use the ratio. Yeah, we depend mainly uh, uh, greatly on the ratio, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. When the ratio between the neutrophil to lymphocyte in the presence of lymphocytopenia, lymphocytopenia is present in more than 80% of our patient. When the ratio of lymph neutrophil to lymphocyte is more than 3.13, especially in those who are aged more than 50, we consider this patient is in severe case. When he is in respiratory failure or acute respiratory distress syndrome, or when they, uh, there is any evidence of organ failure, that time we consider the patient as a critical patient. So what about our patient in, in a nursery? More than half of, or around half of the patient was mild. Yeah, 52% was mild cases. 33, 34.5% was moderate. And only 13% I either my severe or a critical patient. Critical patients are those patients who need ventilator. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have only three patients 
from uh, severe cases who need ventilator and unfortunately all of them are died. How we manage management of patient with COVID-19 infection in the current governorate depend on the Ministry of Health protocol. They divide the treatment or they classify the treatment according to the severity. For example, in mild cases, we use only hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. While in moderate to severe, we using uh, in mild to moderate, we use Tamiflu. In moderate to severe, we use a combination antiviral is added to the regime, which is Caltra. And in a critical patient, uh, a high, uh, high concentration oxygen, non-invasive uh, procedures, and later on, the use of ventilator. The dose of hydroxychloroquine was 400 milligram twice a day for day one, and then we continue on 200 milligram twice a day, while for azithromycin, it was 50 milligram in the first day, and we continue for uh, every day 25, 250 milligram, while for, uh, for Tamiflu, it was 75 milligram twice a day. According to the protocol of the Minister mm -hmm. of Health, all our patients, uh, they we use for them hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and azithromycin. What is the fate? Yeah, it is a good news. Most of our patients are survive and they cure. We have around 87.6% of our patients are discharged and now they are at home. And only there is 8.6% still in the patient. And unfortunately, we <coughs> lose three of our patients, which consider of 3.8% mortality in uh, the car governorate. The three patients who are died, uh, one of them uh, was age, uh, his age was 85, and he has heart failure and renal failure. Uh, the second one was uh, a female patient, 56 uh, years, with the history of ischemic heart disease, and the last uh, one, uh, 46 year old, uh, policeman. Uh, he is only hypertensive with uh, obesity, but his basal metabolic uh, body mass index was less than 30. That's our story. That's what we have. And lastly, I should thank for all for listening to me and goodbye. Thank you. Shukran Jazeera and Dr. Dhiya, very interesting uh, uh, lectures and uh, starting question and answer. Uh, if any question and answer, you can be writing the question and answer all from the attendance. Okay. Uh, the, the first question, what is the mechanism of interceptums in patients with COVID-19? And it is, is there correlation between severity of gastrointestinal symptoms and fecal viral antigen? This is the question for uh, Dr. Faiz. Uh, salam again. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, one third of the cases, one third of the, one third of the cases uh, uh, of pulmonary cases actually of COVID, they have uh, after the recovery they have uh, uh, the virus in the stool. And we know that the mechanism is uh, having the, uh, the virus will cause uh, uh, immunosuppression, disturbance in the immune system, and then uh, the symptoms will be uh, exaggerated, let's say, all kinds of symptoms, mainly the diarrhea, actually, vomiting, nausea, all of them because of irritation, 
uh, of the virus itself, like with viral infection, except it's more uh, exaggerated due to the immunosuppression. Uh, the, the, the immunosuppression of the virus itself that causes it, that would be create the, the, uh, uh, the exaggeration of the symptoms. Anything else? Is it clear? Okay. Okay, yes. clear. Thank you. The second question is, will the uh, recuperative patient from coronavirus has sex bro problem in the future? This is for the I, We need different. I read an article, actually. I, I'm, I, I usually concentrate on the endoscopy only. Uh, Dr. Basti? The question is uh, The question is The question Will the recuperative patient from coronavirus has sex problem in the future? I think recovered patient is a recovered patient. Recovered patient is from corona. Have a problem have a with problem with uh, has a sex problem in the future. Uh, there are uh, at first some some reports that may need uh, that uh, maybe coronavirus may affecting uh, the uh, fertility or they may affect uh, the sexual desire. But uh, till now there are no good evidence or uh, proven uh, this uh, theory. Uh, there are also some say that uh, they detect the viral uh, in, the, in the seminal fluid, but till now there is no documentation about this talk. The second question, Dr. Zia, how far successful of the remdesivir vaccine? Remdesivir. Vaccine or treatment? This is, uh, this is uh, not a vaccine. In our situation, really, really, in our situation, most of the moderate patient or who has uh, a moderate symptom, we use this uh, antiviral and the uh, result is good. Uh, and there is no any side effect reported in our governorate and our 85, uh, 81 patient who uh, received uh, the treatment uh, for chloroquine, uh, azithromycin, uh, Tamiflu and uh, combination antiviral, there is no side effect reported in our, uh, apart from mild symptom, Sarat Adnawayel chloroquine in some patient uh, uh, in form of GIT upset. Point. Uh, Dr. Daya, uh, question Is there any rule for anticoagulation or antithrombotic therapy in coronavirus infection disease? Your experience? Yeah. Thank, thank you. Very good, very good question. Very good question, Victor. Uh, nowadays, when uh, at first they consider COVID-19 is only a respiratory disease, they found later that the main problem is, is the uh, microcoagulant or microthrombi and the using of uh, uh, anticoagulation is considered in the regimen of treatment of uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, yeah, we use it in our society uh, in those with uh, severe symptom. Uh, uh, 11 patient, uh, uh, among 81 person, we have 11 patient, uh, severe cases. We consider them severe cases. We prescribe for them anticoagulation. We not prescribe thrombolytic. We prescribe only anticoagulant. Uh, and the result was uh, is uh, good. Uh, we have eight patients; they survive, uh, and uh, good result after adding anticoagulation. Uh, unfortunately, three patients who need a ventilator, in spite of using all the modalities of treatment, uh, uh, they are uh, not getting a benefit. But uh, the number of the patients we are using with them uh, anticoagulation re uh, really it is a small number. We cannot uh, consider it. Yes. Uh, interesting question, Dr. Dia. What was behind the low number of cases in the car? How it is deviated from the expectation of the severe outbreak in Nasriya? 
Thank you very much, Victor. There are many explanations for this, uh, really. Uh, some of them, they can be explained, and some of them still uh, nobody answer on, in the world. Uh, definitely, uh, the uh, ranging of uh, uh, disease, infection all over the wa world cannot be explained. How we explain the low number in Yemen, for example? How we explain uh, in the world and in the, our area in the Middle East, the highest, the highest infection was reported in Iran, uh, and the lowest is in uh, El, uh, Yemen. Uh, Iraq is is, is the uh, number uh, in the schedule is number eleven in the uh, Middle East countries. Uh, really, there is uh, uh, the, the differences uh, not uh, solved till now. Why the disease is more aggressive in Europe? and why, why there are a, a higher number uh, uh, of the disease in the Europe and not in the Middle East and in Africa. Although uh, the health services is different and you know the facilities, but nobody uh, can uh, explain and predict. Uh, regarding our governorate and a lower number of cases reported in our governorate can be explained by the fact uh, that 80% uh, they are asymptomatic and really we are not searching for any asymptomatic patient. The number of the swabs given, uh, taken in our governorate is too low. So only those with high suspicion or intermediate suspicion, uh, uh, we're taking the swab from only suspected case, only who symptomatic case. Many patients, especially older age, uh, because of uh, in Iraq and even in our governorate, they consider now COVID-19 as a stigma. Many patients, they have a symptom, they're not coming to the hospital. Many old age, they fear from our hospital and from searching and even from the swab itself. So that's why uh, this number is the iceberg phenomena of the disease, really. I think so. There are more and more, but we are not searching for them. Uh, another question, Dr. Zia, from Russell Anwar. The question said, why female patients more than male? Uh, really, this is uh, for our uh, governorate only. Uh, we, uh, when we analyze our patient, which is, uh, and, uh, I said that in Iraq, in general, in Iraq, 55% male, 45% female. Yeah, male, male act more than female. In our government, we discover a little bit female is higher because most of our patients, 81 patients, most of them are contact. We, uh, in our society, in our society, usually female uh, are stay in home uh, in contact with the, with the diseased patient more than male. Usually the male uh, are uh, in the walk, in the, in the street, uh, outside the home. Uh, female, uh, uh, most of the females uh, stay at home during this uh, disease and during this period, they more contact. So most of the patient, uh, if we uh, reanalyze uh, our patient, we find that the focus is male, but the contact is female. Usually, in all the families who, uh, who contract the disease, the focus, the, the, uh, the person who, who, who brings the disease to the family is a male. But unfortunately, the contacts the contact are female. Uh, Dr. Dhiya, a question from Dr. Abdel Murtafi Jabari. Is, uh, is if this percentage of the death and the patient you need this unit for isolation, such as this big hospital and most important hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Dr. Abdel Murtafi, for this question. Yeah, we, uh, although I am, uh, I am uh, not a decision maker, but uh, the decision was made according to the, the expected numbers. Uh, doctor, uh, if you, uh, if you are with me uh, from the first of uh, my lecture, I said the expected number, the least, uh, they, they expect 
some, some they expect that 40%, 40 to 70% of the population will be infected. And this is, this is not from me, this is from Germany. They, in Germany, they expect that 40 to 70% of the population will be infected. If we apply this percentage in our society, in Thikar, we have 2 million. That means there is a 1 million person will be infected with COVID-19 if, if uh, apply the same equation. The least, the least, they expect only 10%. Even 10%, it means 200,000 of our population will be infected. For So if you have a 200, if you have not 200, if you have 20,000, if you have 1,000 patients, where you admit them? So we should prepare ourselves for the battle. Nobody apologize ourselves. This is a battle, really a battle. If we have a, a 1,000 patients, where we admit? So we prepare ourselves for around 2,000 patients. But when the condition and when we analyze after two months, uh, now we uh, rearrange uh, ourselves and we use uh, uh, a special word for the COVID-19, not a big hospital. Thank you, Dr. Zia. The other question, Dr. Zia, why are we still using the hydroxychloroquine in Iraq in our protocol? And all the recent studies show that it is so risky and associated with a higher mortality rate. This is a good question, Doctor. I concentrate it in the in the in my lecture. First of all, uh, we are uh, uh, our hospital is part of the uh, uh, governorate hospitals. Uh, we apply, uh, we use what uh, Minister of Health protocol. Uh, so we treat our patient according to the protocols, which uh, from the Ministry of Health, uh, but uh, sh uh, sure, uh, I said there is no any side significant side effect in all our patients. Uh, all of them, they receive the treatment and there is no the reported side effect which are here uh, about them in Europe and the uh, United States, they are not reported. We monitoring our, our patient daily for any side effect and if it is occur, we stop it but there is no side effect and we not stop our treatment. Uh, that's why we continue uh, and we have a good result. Another question, Dr. Ria, is it is possible to recover patient infected again? And you see this uh, in our patient in the... Is it possible? Yeah, it is possible. All over the world, it is yes. possible. Uh, yeah, it is possible. In the car, in the car, we asking uh, our patient when we discharge them to return back to us uh, after 14 days for uh, another another swap. Till now, we not uh, catch such case, but it is possible. The another question, Doctor Ziaou, Doctor Ziaou, of course, we are grateful for your service. With your Doctor. Allah bless you. Is the COVID-19 cause renal failure and why? COVID-19, uh, this is my uh, interest. Job. This is my interest <laughs> near a uh, year. Yeah, Doctor. Uh, COVID-19 is a multi-systemic disease. COVID-19 is a multi-systemic disease. One third of the mortality all over the world is due to cardiac and renal um, uh, involvement. Uh, acute kidney disease uh, is reported in uh, up to 40% of patients with COVID-19. COVID-19 is part of the uh, multisystemic disease and renal, renal, renal impairment is uh, a recognized feature of uh, COVID-19 infection. The underlying cause uh, can be explained by uh, the same uh, mechanism Either, either is to, due to cytokine uh, storm uh, or due to uh, microemboli and thromboembolic phenomena, thromboembolic phenomena. In addition to the, uh, it is a sepsis and it is a, a multi-organ failure. We, uh, so, and we, uh, in our patient, we have some patient 
uh, but not reaching this uh, figure. We have only around 28% uh, of patients who have renal impairment. We not need dialysis for every one of them. Dr. Faiz, about plasma, using of plasma. Excuse me, and I, I don't, I think, yeah, I don't think I can answer the thing because I don't ah, okay. know. My work is endoscopy, but I have a comment. Yes, actually. yes. Uh, I have Dr. a question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Doctor Dia, what about? And I have, I have a comment. Excuse me. Just yes, a comment. One, okay. What's, what's of what? One of the question uh, yeah. that I receive here now on the panel from the panel, uh, from the attendees, uh, he's asking as a dean. Uh, when he wants to, you know, the surgical mask we mentioned about has colored side and non colored side. So he's asking which one should be outside is the colored or non colored? Just for, for those who, who don't know, uh, the colored side should be outside of the body from outside, the uncolored should be inside. Just a quick answer for this man. Excuse me, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm endoscopy man, and I cannot go. Yes, yes, this. I know. I know. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Much. Uh, question about uh, use of plasma treatment of COVID-19. It is also it is reported, but uh, one thing is important uh, for COVID-19 in infection. Uh, immunity immunity is questionable till now. Uh, the use of plasma is uh, till now is controversial. But uh, really, to me, if we have a critical patient and severe patient, let us try with him uh, plasma. But uh, one, one uh, fact should be known for all uh, that uh, we need at least two weeks after recovery from COVID-19 infection to use the plasma. Yeah, yeah. That's meaning every patient who have COVID-19 infection and recover, we, there is, should be at least two weeks period uh, after recovery from COVID-19 infection till uh, and th at that time you can use uh, the plasma of the patient for treating. Uh, it is uh, a trial. Uh, there is a controversy about it, but to me, uh, for every severe and critical patient, we should use everything because the mortality is high. Really, in base center, 80% of patient, of critical patient on ventilator, May died because of COVID-19. It is a fatal disease. Doctor, thank you very much. We have a lot of questions. I think it's possible to answer them quickly. Quickly, Doctor. Yes, it's possible. Yes. The first question is that you said in mild proved infection, use the chloroquine and azithromycin, but they have prolonged QT. While if use uh, Tamiflu only. It is better than the use of two dangerous drugs might induce arrhythmia? I, I, uh, from pharmacological point of view, yeah, but we yes. are uh, obey uh, the, uh, yes. the protocol from the Ministry of Health and really there is no side effect in our governor. For that. Good, we uh, thank you. This, the, another question from Ad Dr. Adil Ghassab, any rule of postural drainage and aspiration? In those with bilateral lung infiltrate? Postural drainage? Yes, postural drainage and aspiration. Being Kaussian, physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is part of the supportive treatment. Yes. Okay. Part uh, of the does, supportive treatment. Does heat eliminate the COVID 19 virus? I don't, I don't I don't think so because yes. because it is it is too uh, too hot now good uh, another question from Dr. Awajde can I get sick with covered 19 uh, with COVID-19 if it is in food other food transmission food, food transmission not reported sick from food, food. Trans Food transmission, food, transmission, food, yes. food transmission is not reported, but uh, they recommend if you are fear from transmission, uh, heat what uh, your food before eating. 
جود ذا نذر كويشن دو يو ثينك ذا تمبرتشر هاف ايبل هاي احنا جاوبناها هسه اعتقد يو وي هاف ذير از نو ان ان اكسسيف ستاديز اباوت ذا هيت اي ثينك ذا دكتور هاو ماني تيست وير بيرفورم وير بيرفورم فروم ذا بيجينينج اوف ذا فيروس تو ناو يعني يسهل على عدد التحاليل لحد الان اعتقد هيك السؤال يعني كم سؤال يعني لكل فور ايتش فور ايتش بيشنت لو توتال نو نو على التوتال نمبر هذا يعلن يوميا في وزاره الصحه بس ذي سي ذات ذي ويل دو اباوت 10000 سواب افري داي ان ذا نيكست فيو دايز اي دونت نو اكزاكت جيد انا ذا كويشن فروم دكتور خلدون من طب نينوى Uh, my question to Dr. Zia: How frequent, how frequent, how frequent, sorry, gastrointestinal features in your treated patients, and if so, was it severe? Yes, the GIT features. We have some GIT features, but they are not severe. We 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 report about we report about ten percent. They have GIT, especially in uh, one one pregnant patient. And in children. I think the list is more frequent on the weather and on the plasma. The question is here, Doctor Zia. What was the percentage of patients who need mechanical ventilations and they have are recovered well? In our governorate, unfortunately, no. We have only three patients who need mechanical ventilation, and uh, all of them are died, unfortunately. Thank you very much to Dr. Faiz from Syria and Assistant Professor Dr. Zia Khalaf from the Nasriya. في نهاية الجلسة الصباحية تشكر عمادة كلية الطب جامعة ذي قار شركة أسينو وفريقها التقني لرعاية المؤتمر وتوفيره كل الدعم التقني واللوجستي. كما ندعوكم صباح جميعا لحضور الجلسه المسائيه هذا اليوم والتي تبدا ان شاء الله في الساعه التاسعه مساء بتوقيت بغداد وستتم مناقشه كرنت كوفيد 19 كرايسيس اند اتس افكت اون ادوكيشن حيث يحاضر فيها مجموعه من الاساتذه الافاضل شكرا جزيلا لحضوركم شكرا